Hello, Centurion Faith and like-minded believers. Jason Worley here again with a special message for us tonight, and uh, happy Sunday. Today, we are going to be discussing authenticity, and um, <laughs> you know, I'm about to have to buy another Bible. This is um, this is my grandfather's Bible, and it's starting to fall apart. It's one of my cherished possessions. I I have my uh, Greek Hebrew, Hebrew study Bible, my Zadiyadi. I've studied this for the last 10 years, and um, it's finally gotten to a point where the lettering's too small for my eyes. So I backed up into using my grandfather's Bible, and this is the real deal. I've jokingly said that this Bible, for the last couple sermons I've used it, and this Bible is special, not just to me, but I think if I left it on a table alone with the other Bibles, I'd come back and the other two would be swallowed. So um, it's really special. And I need to stop using it before any more pages fall out. But um, there's an authenticity to this Bible. And there's an anointing on this Bible that's unlike the other Bibles. And there's a reason behind things that are blessed by God and cursed by God. And it's important that we know the difference and what is real and what is fake. Today, we're going to be taking a look at, at the season that we're in, because here it is. Today is what's known as Easter, and this is known as a national Christian holiday, but at the same time, it has pagan roots, and we have to understand why we do what we do, and it's important that we both understand what's going on around us and also be passers by, but we must be wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. Our testimony in this world is important. It's not always so much important how they're doing it, but it's important what you're doing with it, okay? So let's look at this. First of all, we have Easter. This is the day Easter, Sunday, March 31st. It's it's the equinox, okay? It's the solstice. This equinox and solstice goes into back to pagan days it's um it's a pagan um time of fertility this is a time of semiamorous this is a time of asherah this is a time of the goddess easter or Esther or Esther. and this particular time you have these rabbits and you have these eggs and the kids they go find the eggs because you know they got the baskets you have all the rabbits because you know it's spring and um but what we deduct from this is that the rabbits in North mythology, these were, um, they were worshipped. Um, the goddess Semiamorous, she would uh, apparently transform the birds into rabbits. They'd lay these eggs in other pagan traditions. Um, you would also just have the rabbits preserved and worshipped as fertility symbols. You also had goddesses in which children were sacrificed to for Easter, and then the eggs were dipped in the blood of the children for magical resource to get the gods of fertility to um, bring forth the season for the harvests. And this is um, this is the original design and why it's why it has to do with the equinox. Um, it's pagan. It's completely pagan. And the way this works is that it's in proximity with what is Passover. Now there's confusion on this because in the in the time of in the time before Jesus, back in Exodus in Exodus 12, we're told um, this is the time where we'll just go there right now. Let's dive into Exodus chapter 2 or chapter 12 verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron and and the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month for the year of you. Speak ye unto all the congregations of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers. A lamb for the house. A lamb for the house of the, their fathers. Yes, this was a day of sacrifice not children, not to dip bloody eggs, but a lamb of sacrifice, you see. Now, hold that thought, because as Christians, 
we know that this lamb is Christ. Okay, and if the household uh, to uh, if the household be too little for a lamb, let the household's neighbor unto the house. So you know it's also a thing where you're supposed to share. You're supposed to share, and this is a day of sacrifice. This is a day of sacrifice, and what we need to understand is Christianity also didn't come to Judaism. Um, they kind of stepped away from it. If you were to go back to 140 AD, they weren't teaching the Old Testament. That didn't come into play till 200, 300 years later, because you were getting further away from the roots of Jesus. So for historical state, sake, the the Old Testament was brought into play with the New Testament. And there was also an apocrypha in the middle, which were historical books of reference, but not holy books, which is also why um, we went from a 77 canon down into a 66 canon. Now, what do we do with this? First, we have to understand there's different seasons of God's word. Um, first, the first Christians, they had only the Old Testament and Jesus arriving. After Jesus's arrival, then the apostles went out and it was word of mouth, much like the Old Testament was word of mouth until it was written by Moses. So what was word of mouth went out and for the next from Jesus's death, let's say uh, AD 33 um, to AD 50 and 60, these are when the letters started accumulating, um, which are the letters of the apostles, okay? And then the gospels were also jotted down um, before a couple centuries went by. And, and this was what was collaborated is what we know as the holy book of scripture. This is the 66 books of, of the King James canon. Now, before 1611, when the King James canon was developed, um, you did have previous Bibles. Now, you go to those, and you will see that where it says in the King James the word Easter, the word Easter wouldn't be in the Bible. The King James came into play after, after Passover was kind of shunned off and then combined end with Easter, and then the King James was written. So being the King James was written at a fifth grade level in the 1600s as a modern Bible, the word was modernized, just like the NIV modernizes words. They were bringing things up to their current so that the people could understand it. Um, so Passover became Easter, and that's why there's an argument today. I say this all because there's the argument that, well, it says Easter in, in some King James, but it doesn't say it in all of them, and it didn't say it in previous books. Um, it said Pesach, or Passover, that's what it means in Hebrew, and uh, or Pesach would probably be the proper way to pronounce it. Uh, I'm not Jewish, my mother is, um, but I'm Christian, so I celebrate the first day of Passover as the Christians did, because after Jesus died, there was a time when they did celebrate the first three days of Passover. They celebrated the first three days of Passover, and it began the night before, just like the eve of Passover. So when we look at Passover, let's look at this. What we celebrate is Easter once was a Jewish tradition called Passover. Uh, the Passover was started because the firstborn in Egypt was to die. This was the final plague that God brought down on the Egyptians because he wouldn't let Moses and his people go. They just wanted to go worship the Lord, and so they went through uh, the, fro the frogs, they went through blood, they went through locusts, they had lice, they had all kinds of things, and he wouldn't budge. Well, then God decreed he was going to kill the firstborn of all children in Egypt. So the Hebrews had to go to their doorways and take the sacrificial lamb's blood and place it over the door. So that every every house, they sacrificed this lamb. And if the neighbor couldn't afford a lamb, then they, they shared this privilege to mark their door. So as the angel of death passed over Egypt that night, he wouldn't take those who were marked. Now, for this reason in deliverance, we use anointing oil, and we anoint the doors of our houses, especially in hard times, especially in conflicts of the world. These are the times, and I highly suggest 
that we all anoint our doors with oil and bless our houses in the name of Jesus, that no destruction come upon us. In fact, um, this is a, a physical effort you can do, and it's in a line with chapter 12 here in Exodus. Um, but right now, Lord, we ask in the spirit right now, with all things going on in the world, the wars, the rumors of wars, all the things happening, Father God, we just ask that in the spirit we go and we place the blood of Christ over every doorway, every house, every window of all the believers listening right now in Jesus' mighty name. We ask that the angel of death pass over us and all destruction of Beelzebub and Satan, um, poverty, just destruction, godlessness, and the spirit of Antichrist be blocked away from each one of our houses, our homes, our dwellings, and our temples. Let us not live by the sword, but walk in peace in Jesus' mighty name. For your word says that you will cover us, that you provide for us, that you will see to us, and you will see us through the storm. Just as you did the, the Israelites out of Egypt, you opened the waters so that they would have free passage from the danger ahead and the danger behind. Father God, we ask that you take us the same. And you bring us into your promised land and safety. And we ask for our houses, our dwellings, and our temples to be anointed and marked with the blood of Christ this day. In Jesus' mighty name. Okay. So there was an importance of marking the doors. And respectably, they escaped Egypt. They were on the path of the Lord. And this is the point. You'll also find it in um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 13.5. It also speaks about um, about honoring this day. It's we should honor Passover according to the Scripture if we're Jewish. Now, how this pertains to us as Christians, for the first two hundred years, the followers of Jesus did address Passover and celebrated on the first day. They did this. They did this by um, re remembrance, and this is where the blood of Christ and drink of my blood, eat of my flesh, because we are consuming Christ's blood symbolically and eating his bread for Passover sake and remembrance that he died for us, just like the, the Hebrews had a remembrance of their leaving Egypt. You see, the first eve of Passover, they would eat matzah bread and they'd have bitter things to remind them that the matzah bread was kind of cheap food, unleavened bread, and they'd eat bitters. And this was to remind them of their slavery. This was to remind them of their bondage. God wants us to remember where we came from. We will forget who we were, but we have to remember where we came from so we don't become it again, so that we don't dishonor the Lord, so we don't become disrespectful. Um, we look back to the changes God's made in our life so that we can praise him. And this is the first uh, note of Passover. We're to understand by eating the flesh of Christ symbolically and drinking the blood the wine, the grape juice, however you want to say it, you are you are taking part in in the cross. You are taking part with Christ, and He is taking part with you. Um, just like the Hebrew people, they were lamenting and eating bitters and thinking back to how they escaped Egypt. This is the first eve of Passover. This is when Jesus died. This is also where we have our bitters. This is where we have our time of remembrance. The second day of Passover, for the Jewish people, this commemorates their deliverance from Egypt. This commemorates their freedom from Egypt. And just like the deliverance and the freedom that came from Egypt, this is also as Jesus went into the earth and freed the captives that were just in um, Abraham's bosom, gave them the opportunity to be free. And certainly some of the prophets rose and testified on that, uh, on that very time when he went into the earth. That's how fast he was bringing freedom to the captives. Um, so that's the second day of Passover is recognizing um, the freedom of Egypt for the Israelites and the freedom of the captives from Jesus. Now, the third day of Passover, the third day of Passover has to do for the Israelites of their revelation, of their victory and of their salvation um, as God's people. Now, Jesus rose on the third day. So this is also our revelation. This is also our victory. And this is our salvation. Um, in Christianity, this was condensed to a day and a remembrance for the month, but an understanding of the parallel of the first three days to the time that Jesus went into the grave and rose from the grave. Now, 
this um this was combined this was all combined um back in the day of constantine and the council of nicaea this was all brushed together because passover was kind of brushed off as the jewish people were kind of brushed off catholicism took over christianity after wiping out the apostles um and so now we're at a transition time where the roman catholic empire is running the world but king james is rising to a point where he wants an english bible the roman catholic church isn't after king james they're at odds but this council forms together to eliminate which books were holy and which weren't like i said there were 77 books and so it was determined not by king james not not even um by it was the council of nicaea it wasn't one man in particular this was scrutinized and really gone through and what happens in time like i said at the beginning there wasn't a bible then there were just the uh, the epistles and then after the epistles then there were gospels and then after time after time there became a, a an 88 chat there was an 88 canon it had 88 books to it that book still exists and, and hasn't changed that is the orthodox canon of ethiopia um they have the, the full apocryphas, they have the Old Testament and the New Testament. They have the full collaboration because it never went through the Catholic Church and it never went through the Council of Nicaea. Now, what they do with the, over there is what the Lord is doing with his people there, um, just like what he was doing when they only had the epistles, just like what he was doing with his word when only Jesus was giving it. There's different times and different seasons, and God appropriates us with what we need. He's appropriated us with the 66 book canon and this is what applies for us and where he wants us in the world and this pretense it brings out much spiritual warfare that we share with the world um we're not so much looking after the mysteries and the hidden or the gnostic information we're seeking out the absolute truth and that's that's the beauty of having 66 canon uh, canon book is that this this has 66 books they've not been elaborated on uh, they've not been added to these are what is deemed holy and that's why we as as western christians go by this book because it doesn't have loose threads to bring us off into fair error and false doctrine and this is where god wants us right now amen so we get what the lord gives us in the times that the lord gives us in the seasons the lord gives us and that's what we utilize so I say all that because we're covering the note of differences. We So we know now that Easter is indeed a pagan celebration. And you can deduct from it and say, oh, well, you know that it's spring. You know, you got bunnies. And and then there's Easter eggs because the eggs. And, you know, it's fun watching the kids do it. But you have to realize that the bunny was a symbol of idolatry. And the colored eggs were the blood of children sacrificed. They were dipped in. Now... I could go on and on, but it gets darker and darker. And what we have to understand is that just like nursery rhymes, there's some darkness behind things. And we have to examine why we do what we do, why we say what we say, why we engage our children in things that we don't fully understand. That being understood, you know, hey, marshmallow peeps with some sugar on it, a chocolate bunny, you know, Make sure you educate your children to be good passers-by because we have a bad testimony in the world when we persecute the world for our dogmatic beliefs. And what we know is true, some other people might not be able to understand, and our attitudes can keep people from even wanting to be receptive. So I say all this because as Christians, we have to be um, forgiving of one another we have to realize there's other people in the world who don't see it our way and we can have our faith we can have our beliefs and we have to um, do what's right according to the word of god according to the holy spirit and the conscience that he's given us but we also have to uh, be respectable to other people and know that us being forceful about what easter really is isn't going to win people over but what it is is to explain to other christians what they shouldn't be engaging in 
And by all means, if uh, if you're listening to this and, and you're a pagan, I mean, no offense. This is it's what it is. Um, and I welcome you to seek after our Lord. If you're a Christian, I expect that you should stay away from Easter practices um, and understand what they're doing and be a good passerby and polite to other people, as well as other Christians who are still on the meat, on the milk of the gospel, because what I'm giving you here is strong meat. This is something that people have to throw out their religious apple carts. They have to um, get away from religious spirits. They have to get away from worldly spirits, spirits of antichrist, spirits of idolatry that they thought was part of their celebration to God. Um, now, as far as Passover, if you're not Jewish, you're you're not expected to engage in Jewish things. You don't, this was determined early on when the apostles said, look, there's 613 laws that none of us can keep. We can't even hold 10. So how are we going to hold these standards to other people? Which is why the, the old Testament wasn't part of gospel that was being preached. It wasn't what they were out there preaching. They were preaching Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ taught. And that's another thing I like to say. There's a lot of people out just preaching Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But you can get away with preaching Jesus to a point where things get lost and it becomes a bad representation because what Jesus was telling us to preach to the world was him, but not just him, but what he was teaching. We are to preach what Jesus was teaching. We are to preach what Jesus was telling us to do. We have to spread the good news that we knew from his teachings. Sometimes we get too far out, so busy trying to get the word of Jesus out, we don't get the words of Jesus out. And that's also where the bad testimony comes in. We have to do as Jesus said, not just speak about Jesus. You see, that's the difference between being religious and being faithful. And the world knows what religion is. It doesn't impress them. But when they see true faith, when they say true belief, when they see true holiness moving through people without dogmatic haughty attitudes and false humility, that's that's what draws in other people. Because nobody, nobody, nobody really wants to see the underbelly of the beast of Easter or Christmas. But sometimes we have to look at these things and examine ourselves. And this is what Passover is about, is to examine ourselves. I do encourage that you take a time to remember Jesus, to uh, drink of his blood and, and eat of his flesh and remember that we are taking part in that cross. Remember that he died and on the third day he rose. Remember that this was a bitter time for the first day, but it was freedom from the captives on the second day. And on the third day, we all had a new revelation. We had a new victory. We have a new salvation. The law had changed. The law had changed, and the law had changed in Christ. In fact, let's look at that. Let's go to um, Hebrews 7, 12, real fast. Real fast. Going as fast as I can. All right, here we are in Hebrews 7, 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, a change, also, of the law. All right. Well, this is a long time coming. There is a change of the law. Okay. We have a particular change in the law because Jesus was not a Levite priest. When the priesthood changes, the law changes. Now, at the same time, we have to understand Jesus came and said, I did not come to abolish the law, but uphold it. He came to uphold it as the Father's right hand. Uh, he added to it. He perfected what was fouled. Uh, it was a law written down by man that was fouled by man. This was Moses. He wrote down the law. God gave a law, but that law hit the ground. Moses went back up the mountain, if we remember, for another 40 days, 40 nights, and he jotted down the new law. This was a law written with Moses being angry, this was a law with him showing the people that you cannot do these things. The problem was they didn't want to face God. 
And they kept asking Moses, they wanted him to face God. And they kept asking Moses, what can we do to please God? And he said, we'll love God. And all things are hung on that. But they wanted law. They wanted law. They sent him up there. And then they assumed that he was gone. They said he's dead. They they wanted something just like uh, people wanted. They didn't want prophets. They wanted a king and they wanted Saul. And that wasn't good for them because he wanted to give them a man after his own heart. And they wanted a champion. God wants to be your champion. In the same aspect, this was this was a, a, a time when the people doubted. They doubted God. They doubted Moses' return, and they made idols. They made idols waiting, and they couldn't even wait for him to come back with the law that they asked him to go get. So this is a process of 80 days. He went up there for 40 days, uh, established the law with God, brought it back, was disgusted with their behavior, threw it down went back up for 40 days to atone for them again. And then he wrote down the law. The law was hard and it was fallible and it was followed and it was correct, but it was fouled because you could not achieve it. And it wasn't fully understood. It was being misrepresented. And that's why Jesus had to come back and reestablish this. You see, God doesn't want laws and legalism that's written on a tablet that you follow vainly he wants you to really work on yourself. He wants the laws of God written on the tablets of our heart. He wants us to back off the Ten Commandments for a second and realize all Ten Commandments are hung on the very first and only law, which is to love God above all things with all your mind, heart, soul, and all of your being. Love God. And then past that, love each other likewise because we are each other. There is a, a secret to be unveiled when we die. And, and God will show us how true all these things are and why that's so important. But all the commandments are just hung on that law to love, to love God and to love each other likewise. And if we aren't abiding in the Ten Commandments and the love of God and the love of one another, then we've already failed. This is why Jesus was sent to reestablish that he wants these laws in our heart. He doesn't want us to not lie he wants us not to think about lying. He doesn't want us to not do adultery. He doesn't want us to even think ugly about people like that. He wants us to look at each other like brothers and sisters. He wants us to not be hypocrites. He wants us to be real. Judaism had hypocrisy, but he wants us in reality. Judaism had an absence of relationship with lots of religion. and In some sects, there still is. But God wants full relationship without religion. You do not have to be a religious Christian. Did you know that? You don't have to carry on in religious ways. You don't have to be dogmatic. You don't have to have a certain way. You don't have to have a certain dress. You don't have to have a certain style. These are all dogmatic attitudes, and a lot of them are demonic. We have to come to that realization. There is an overflow of demonic religious spirits. And false humility and a spirit of diatrophy is moving in the church today with the spirit of Antichrist. And right now, Father God, we come against all spirits of harsh religion, legalism. We come against all of that right now in Jesus' mighty name. We, uh, we ask that it be loose from the people and bound far away from the minds of the believers. All the religious spirits, all the false humility, loose them and let them go in Jesus' mighty name. We command that everything religious and ceremonial and admiration... Um, to Catholicism or dead religions that are not of the life of Christ, that are not part of our path or shouldn't be in your will. Lord, we ask that be removed from us right now. Admirations to things of this world that are fleshly or soulish behavior that is not of the Spirit of God relating to holidays, relating to uh, family life, the way we just have all this lost in our life. Lord, we ask that you purge us of all these things in Jesus' mighty name, that you draw the line in the sand, that we know the difference, Father God. We ask that you make the taste of these things bitter to us in the honor of your Son, Father God. We ask that the celebrations that are not of you uh, bring us to the remembrance of Christ and the reality of what's going on in Jesus' mighty name. We ask while we're in the middle of all these things that we know how God is working to free people from the center of the earth and, and people from the dead on the earth. He doesn't want us walking around dead. He wants us alive and reborn. Father God, we just ask that you help bring us back to life. We ask for forgiveness for the minds that don't understand these things. They only know soft milk. Lord, 
We ask for understanding for the people receiving this meat. In Jesus' mighty name, make them strong in their Christianity and their faith and in their worship to you. In Jesus' mighty name. Most of all, Lord, we ask that we rise with you. We rise to the occasion. We rise to that third day. We come into our deliverance. We come into our revelation. That we come into our truth. That we come into the revival that you have set for us of truth and Christianity and the absence of the falsehood of religion. In Jesus' mighty name. Just ask that right. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Amen. You see, in our in our Jewish brothers and sisters, or or even those that are into um, Masonic uh, tabernacles, and they celebrate Jesus in their way, you have to understand this is their culture. If they call Jesus Yahshua, that's because that's what Jesus is in their native tongue. That's untranslated to them. There's much issue about whether his name was actually Roman or in the Hebrew context. But whether you're calling him Joshua, whether you're calling him a Yahshua, whether you're calling him Jesus, uh, whether you're calling him Josh, you know, a rose by any other name, it's still a rose. Jesus is Jesus. If you are worshiping the right Jesus, he knows who you're talking to. We have different attributes to different people. To my children, I'm dad. To my wife, I'm husband. To my mother, I'm son. Uh, to my congregation, I'm Jason. To my friends, I'm brother world. So, um, you know, we shouldn't split hairs in Christianity. We have to get down to what's real, what's important. What are salvation issues? What are non-salvation issues? What's the walk and what's the talk? That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to stop being symbolic, wiping the outside of a glass when the inside's filthy needs to be washed out we have to get away from what was ceremony and get into what is actual spiritual and spiritual all begins with love you say how do you be a real spiritual person you love god you love god and you seek after god you say i'm not good with love it starts with god you start with god and then you work on yourself and then you reflect that on other people and that's what draws people in nobody's drawn by religion nobody's drawn by religion everybody's reaching up but nobody is drawn by religion. They are drawn by God because there is a need that all people have. And you say, I don't have that need. I'm an atheist. Well, <laughs> see, that's just it. And that's also why you're angry. That's why you're so bitter at Christianity is because you don't understand what they're doing. So you assume there's a falsehood to it because some of the people act false. But the truth is in the word of God. The truth is the word of God. So many times we misrepresent and are misrepresented too in religious context. Christianity is the non-religious religion, but you wouldn't recognize that by the way the world turns. Amen. So, in all this being said, I just want us to have a firm understanding of what the genuine article is. What, what are you doing when you're celebrating a day? You need to stop and ask yourself why. Ask yourself, is God in it and where? And how does that apply to my life? And pray about these matters. All of you have to make a decision on this. And I'm not here to judge, you know, if kids like marshmallows covered in sugar and chocolate. I'm indifferent what the shape of it is, but just understand they need to know what's involved. My children understand what Easter is about. They also understand what candy is about. It doesn't have to be attached because our God's greater, our God's bolder, and we shouldn't yield. Then that's my pet peeve as a pastor so many people preach the message of Jesus dying and rising on the third day on Easter, and they're opposed by other preachers. Listen, I preached the, the resurrection, resurrection message for the last two messages beforehand because I just didn't want the grief, but I have no problem with preachers who preach resurrection any given day of the year. And what better day than on Easter to let everyone else know what it should be about because that's the reality of it but better than that i figured i'd preach resurrection ahead of time and then spend this easter evening just telling you where our minds should be our minds should be with christ our admiration should be with christ not the the awe and the splendor of the bunnies and the rabbits and the little things we do and the you know going out to steak and ale for brunch afterwards maybe a football game or whatever's going on today i, I stay out of it but I do 
encourage us all to consider Jesus, to consider the Passover, to consider why we should cover our doorways, to consider the days ahead and the darkness that we are facing, to consider the bitterness of life and how God gets it through, gets us through all these things, to consider how even after death, we have freedom and that God will never let us go. And this is the beginning of our deliverance and our salvation. And to realize that there is a revelation and we're walking in it. We are in the end times. To consider that it is the right of the believer to lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, that people can recover. It is our right as a believer to understand that we have full authority over the devil. High above principalities, thrones, dominions, world rulers, wickedness on high. We've been given this authority by Jesus Christ. We've been given a life after death. We've been given life and life more abundantly. We've been given a way to see out of the fears of this world to understand what can man do to me. There's nothing that can be taken from us. In fact, if we were to lose this, we just go on into eternal life. Amen. So stop with the fears in the world. I don't want us dogmatic preaching against to other people that don't understand. I want us preaching to people what they need to know. Salvation. Let's stop splitting hairs with one another over days of the week. Let's stop splitting hairs over festivals, over ceremony, and just be real. Be real in Christ. Be real in your beliefs. And so we're going to wrap this up. Let's go to Romans 14. In Romans 14, this is put very, very well. Because what do we do with ourselves and what do we do with other people, what they believe, how they feel about things? Um, they have weaknesses. And in their mind, we have weaknesses. This is an argument that will never be settled until we're before God. And so this is this is something that brings us to the point where we have to be pastors by. Here we are in chapter 14. Paul's talking about this. He's addressing the Romans because they have Jewish people among them, and they're also Romans. They, they have a different way of doing things, yet both of them are coming into Christianity, both with a religious aspect of two different kinds and completely different outlooks on what's holy and what's not. So here we are, chapter 14, uh, Romans. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Okay, so you receive those who are weak in the faith. You don't beat them down but not to for doubtful dispensation for one believeth that he may eat all things okay after peter no no limitation to pork and stuff anymore another who is weak eateth herbs okay and then they have um all their ceremonies and days that they're only supposed to eat this and their special dietary laws okay so how do we handle this as christians this is a religious thing this is more than just food this is way people act because meat is also how you carry on and so what do you do when people are religious what do you do when people aren't religious enough well according to this just receive them just receive them doesn't mean you're agreeing with them but it it means you don't have to argue with, with them about futile matters the focus is salvation and understanding what jesus wants us to be teaching preaching and reaching with not arguing over what we can eat and what day is special and what day isn't. Let not him eateth and despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. You see, if God has taken somebody as a, as a Jewish Christian, the way he's doing them is the way he's doing them. If you are a Gentile Christian, the way that He's doing you the way he's doing you. If you are a Western Christian and a 66 canon, this is the way that God has brought you. This is the path he has you on. If you are an Ethiopian, you have 88 books in your canon. This is the way he's developed you. We don't need to split hairs with people because you'll find out that they're strong. And we don't want to rupture their faith because we could be mistaken. God puts us where he wants us when he wants us. There are some things that are okay for one person, but not another. You say, well, that's not fair. That's life. We're all different. We're different. We're different skin. We're different faces. We're different looks. We're different opinions. We're different points of views. We're different upbringings. And God knows how to handle each one of us. We don't have to go and try to be Jewish 
to get closer to God. We have to be ourselves to get closer to God. We don't have to go try to be Orthodox Ethiopian. If you're not, you're not. Then <laughs> stick with where the Lord has you. It's that simple. You know, this is written in 1600 Elizabethan English, but realize it was written on a fifth grade level so that even a child could understand it. That's the simplicity of Christ. That's the simplicity of the word of God. It's to be understood before adolescence. It's to be understandable before adolescence. You should be able to receive these things. Okay, so picking up chapter 14, 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Ye, he shall be held up for God is able to make him stand. Okay, so you don't need to worry about what God's doing with that guy. You need to leave that up to God. If you have words of wisdom, that's good. If you have words of scripture, but don't bring things to a point of argument, frustration, or bringing doubt in other people's lives. It's important that you let God work with people when you let God work with people. And most of all, let God work with you right now, right here, while he's trying to work with you. Amen. We're, none of us are perfected yet. And I don't know about you, but I, I tell you, I've met some people who are all too perfect. And... Um, their religious is all get out, they squeak, and I, I can't do nothing with that, isn't it? Isn't it just something to know somebody all so perfect? I mean, someone who says to you, oh, you tell me what you think and I'll tell you how it is. Well, you know, that's not how we come together and reason. We have to come together and reason. And if there's not anything to reason on, then there's not a reason to come together. Amen. We got to leave things to the Lord. We have to let the Lord and the Holy Spirit guide us. We put on our dogmatic helmets, but that knocks our helmet of salvation crooked and our mouths get away from us with our convictions that sometimes go unchecked by the Bible. Amen. So here we are. 14, 5, Romans 14, uh, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You see, let him be fully persuaded in his own mind. You can have an opinion. You can state your opinion. But don't force your opinion. You see, everybody loves to be led, but nobody wants to be pushed. You say, oh, you push me, I'm going to push you back. That's right. But hey, which way do we go? Oh, I know the way. It's this way. Oh, you know the way? I'll follow you then. People like to be led, but pushing people will never get anybody anywhere, especially from the outside in. It only push people from the inside out. Amen. And uh, once you find yourself in that situation, then you're stagnant. When ministry doesn't grow, it's, it's stagnant. When it goes backwards, it's stagnating. And if you have these problems going on and you're in a deliverance ministry, then you have to understand stagnation comes out of false humility. Stagnation comes out of religious spirits and stagnation comes out of a spirit of diatrophies, blocking out uh, the new growth of the Holy Spirit. The deliverance is an ongoing and going ministry. If you feel that you've came to the end in full knowledge of everything, then, then you're probably in trouble probably too good for the Lord and he'll retire you. So it's important to always keep growing and always grow by the way of the scripture and have be patient with other, others because no two people are going to find every day exactly alike, maybe similar, but not even alike. So we shouldn't argue with people over these things. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. 14, six Romans 14, six, he that regardeth the day, he regardeth it unto the Lord and he that regardeth it not, he regardeth it not unto the Lord. He that eateth, he eateth unto the Lord. And he that giveth thanks, he giveth thanks unto the Lord. And he that doesn't give thanks unto the Lord, he doesn't give thanks unto the Lord. We need to let people be people. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that's not right. But you don't chase people around with it and argue about it. When you do these things online, you're giving a bad testimony for the world. All the non-believers are going, my, oh, my, look at those Christians. Well, I'm glad I'm not one of them because we're trying to argue among ourselves. It's a shame, people. It's a shame. That's why I come very gingerly about this whole Easter thing because a lot of you celebrate Easter and a lot of you probably even have a bunny showing up at the house to give your kid a basket. And this is all sweet and all. But, but if you do these things, make sure that your kids know what it's really about. I encourage that you don't do these things, but I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to tell you what things are 
and uh, leave it up to you and the Lord to decide for you. So I can't make or break you, nor do I want you to be vainly religious nor dogmatic. I don't want that. I want you to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is exactly what he wants for you, which is exactly what he wants for other people. To do anything less than what Romans 14 is telling us is to deduct from it. Romans 14, uh, 7, for none of us liveth to him own, his own self, and no man dieth to his own self. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, it's unto the Lord. Okay? We're all in our own journey of salvation. We all individually come to the Lord in our salvation in fear and trembling. So I haven't felt that fear and trembling. Stick around. <laughs> He'll make himself apparent. That's the point you start listening, and that's also the point, unfortunately, people start getting dogmatic with others. If you are on the meat of the gospel, let others be on the milk if they're on the milk. There's a lot of people who can't handle the milk, but they're ready for heavy heavy cream. Um, you know, you, you have to you have to give to the people that you have. You can't just blast everybody and you can't underfeed some. You have to be nourishing in your words from the scripture. It's to nourish the mind, not break down. If you're not, if you're not um brought up in wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment, discretion, uh, or connection with the Lord after a sermon, then then it's not hitting it. And I highly encourage you not to just hear the words I say, but dive deep. Look for yourself. Don't take my word for it. I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. I'm a vessel. The Lord uses me, but I'm, I'm just a vessel. And uh, my scripture, I have my opinions just like everyone else. I encourage everybody to get along. It's so important. I've watched the last couple of days of people just flooding the internet, rebuking each other. It's nuts. It's nuts. God doesn't want it that way. It's, God's not in it. God might not be in the actions of Easter, but he's certainly not in the actions of a lot of dogmatic Christians either. It's a bad, bad testimony. Okay. So, uh, but why dost thou judge thy brother? For why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more. Say a lot. Let us not judge one another anymore. Continuing, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. More than being right, it is important to not put a stumbling block in a brother's way. 14, 14, I know, and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing, nothing, say it again, nothing unclean in itself. Paul is saying there's nothing unclean in itself. And this is why I say, you know, if your kids want chocolate bunnies and stuff, just make sure they know what's really going on, okay? You know, it's it would be weak of us to say, well, we can't eat that because it's shaped a certain way. It's just marketing. It's just marketing. I don't think they went through some kind of hippotus, hopitus, magical spell as it came out of the candy factory. It's just an occasion. We make a lot out of things. And if you do, that's, hey, power to you. Don't let your kids have any chocolate and, and, and uh, marshmallows and stuff. And you can be sour for the sake that someone else has spoiled your day, but you really shouldn't let what other people do affect how you praise the Lord. You should, you should really consider these things. So here we are in 14. I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Nothing unclean of itself. The wickedness comes from our heart and out our mouths into this world. It's not the things in this world. We get hung up on that. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. There it is. So... If Joe over there says, well, that's just completely wrong, I don't then then it is. Let him be. Let him be. He can feel that way. If you don't, then you don't. 
I encourage you to examine what's behind everything, but it's up to you to make your decisions of what kind of Christian you want to be. It's up to you how you want to follow the word of God. It's up to you how you see this. You don't agree with me. You don't agree with me. I'm not going to split hairs over it. See what I did there? But here we are in 15, 14, 15. But, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. What's this mean? Okay, well, if someone's not down with Easter, then don't celebrate it with them if you are. And if um, you're a Passover nut and that's not what other people are about, then 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 don't be overzealous at people uh, you know you can't force judaism back on christians who don't believe that that's what they are they accept their gentiles and you're not gonna make people who want to get jewish to be less jewish and encourage them to being more like a gentile you just be yourself be yourself that's what god wants of us that's what he encourages in all of us be yourself in Christ, because that's who he wants to work with. He can't work with religious facades. He can't work with false humility. He can't work with stilted attitudes. He has to work with us, loving God and loving one another. Be yourself. 16, let, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and not drink, but righteousness it's righteousness. It's not a physical substance. It's not fleshly. It's spiritual. It's righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. Not our souls, but in the spirit through the Holy Ghost. And 14, 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable unto God and approved of men. So then who would we be to disapprove of what God said is approved. Amen. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Say that again. Let us follow after the things, therefore, that make for peace. We are to make for peace. We are to walk in peace. And what else? And things wherewith one may edify each other, not break them down, not point out their wrongs, not point out their bads, but edify edify if they're foul help them get out of the holder and if you're not going to help them then leave them alone let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace edify one another if you're in your bible right now i suggest you highlight that because this is the problem with christianity today this is the problem with the testimony today. We get that inside out. We get to a point in our Christianity where we think we should just be telling other people how to be, how to live. And that's that's false humility. That's mind control. That's uh, that's getting outside of the word of God. And God wants us to come back to his word. You see, Christianity has gone wild in the church. It's gone wild in the pulpit. There's too many pastors that are up there road raging from the pulpit, worrying about what everybody else is doing instead of teaching something good to the people. So the people are lost. They end up back at home. Their relationship breaks up. When God is back in the home, then the people will be back in the churches. But right now, God has taken the church back to the home so that it can be edified, so that it can be amplified, so that it can be insulated, protected, so it can be nurtured, so that people will have a relationship, not some fictitious persona, that they put on when they walk into a building, but a relationship and be real with the Lord, just like they are with their family. You can't, you can't bull around with your family, but a lot of people put on when they go to church. Hmm? So God wants us to get to relationship with him and he wants us to keep it real in our own homes. Once we start worrying about the relationship with God in our own homes and how we feel about things, then we'll see that bring a positive effect to the world through our Christianity, not by force, not by might, but by God's spirit. That's, a, that's the Lord that says that. So there's not another way to look at it. And if there is, you're not looking from the eyes of the Bible. 1420, for the meat destroys not the work of God. For the meat destroys not the work of God. For the meat, the meat destroys not the work of God. The meat isn't just 
what you eat. The meat is the way you are, the way you go about things, okay? That's not what destroys the work of God. It's not what you put in your mouth. It's what comes out, okay? So that's what God is dealing with is the heart, the heart matter of things. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for what man who eateth with offense. What's that mean? It means, well, I like pork. You don't like pork. Well, I better not offer you pork. You don't like pork and I like pork. Well, leave him alone. He can eat whatever he wants. You see, and it's not just a matter of food. It's a matter of actions. Well, I live a certain way and you think th things I do in my life are offensive. Well, yeah. And I think that things that you do are offensive. There's some things that have to do with the way we're raised. You might look at someone and be like, now, what kind of Christian is that? Look how he's dressed. Look at what he's wearing. Look at those tattoos on that. Art. You know, and you don't know the heart of that person. Oh, they got those piercings. They got this. They got that. They're not dressed like they're up. They don't have a collared shirt and their hair combed over all nice like, like I do. You know, I mean, some of y'all might be looking at me saying, hey, his beard's getting a little scruffy. You see, we, we have judgment calls. We have these fleshly judgment calls that we bring into Christianity that has nothing to do with the spirit. Now, this is where we have to have grace with people. You don't know. That person with the tattoos might have got him when he was young. Those piercings don't always go away. And um, people come into Christianity as babes. That's why the word of God says they have to have milk. Not everyone's ready for strong meat. We have a different kind of group. We have a, we have a group that fights the devil. We have a deliverance group. We're doing spiritual warfare here. But... Even though we study every day, even though we're very active Christians doing warfare prayers every day, we can't put ourselves on a pedestal, no matter where we're at, low nor high. We can't be stilted with other Christians, and most of all, we cannot make that presentation to the world, because that kills the whole point of what we're doing, which is to spread the good news and show, show in our lives to other people why it is good to be a Christian. We, we need to be something that the other people in the world look at and go, there's something about those people and I want to know more. I want to be like, I want to feel like, I want to act like, but the way that we put on, they just shake their head at us. We really need to start putting our Christianity in the mirror. And it starts with how we deal with occasions by understanding what they're about, what it means to us, what it means to other people and where God draws a line of behavior. Amen. Amen. For meat destroyeth not the works of God. All things indeed are pure. All things are indeed pure. Okay. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine. It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine, nor anything that whereby a brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. We don't do things that would offend or weaken somebody else. Simplest context is it's rude for somebody who drinks to drink in front of somebody who has stopped drinking and has a problem with it. That would be tacky in this same sense. This is how we should be. If there's somebody who doesn't eat meat, then let's not gross them out. <laughs> let's not offer them a pork chop. You know, it's, we have to have some good sense about what we do. We have to. If it makes somebody weak, it's not good. Now, if it's fine to yourself, then it's fine to yourself. We're neither to beat anybody up about it, nor give somebody a weakness. Okay. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Once again, do not worry about everybody else and how they're serving the Lord. That's burden binding. It's also mind control. And it's and it's um, false humility. You need to work on that in your lives. Get it out so that you can see clearly. Get the law out of your eye. Deal with your own problems. Until you're walking on water, you're not in a place to judge anyone else. And by walking on water, I mean able to stand without the Lord pulling you in. There's only one. Amen. 
Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself that thing which he alloweth. Happy is the man who does not condemn himself for what he does. So if he's not in condemnation and he's not finding condemnation, and you might even tell him in a message, but they're not picking up on it, it's not your job to chase them down and make them change. Once again, people love to be led. Nobody likes to be pushed. You push me, I'll push you back. And in closing here, Romans 14, 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eats, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You see, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And if you don't find it sinful, then for that person, that's for God to deal with. God doesn't want you to handle other people. God wants you to lead for other people. He wants you to show the way for other people. He wants to give you salvation. And he wants you to spread that message of salvation. He wants to share with you the teachings of Jesus. And he wants that to spread as well. Not just talking about Jesus, but what Jesus taught. We need to spend more time in the world acting and speaking out what Jesus taught. And then when they ask, then we tell them about Jesus. We got it kind of backwards sometimes, forcing Jesus and not even giving the reason why. Then they look at the example of what we do and they say, well, I don't want that in Christianity. So here we are. It's Easter. So that we understand Easter is not the same date as Passover. Um, it's not the same occasion, but it's been combined. One was after the first new moon of the first year, and the other is for the spring equinox and the, and the summer solstice of pagans. This was put together, and though we can separate these things from society in our minds and our relationships with God, we aren't here to drill everybody about it. Get the word out. Tell truth. That's fine. But please don't argue over it. Be good Christians. Have a good, good testimony for others. Give reason that they want to come to the Lord, that they want to understand our God and Savior. Because sometimes the biggest thing standing in the way of people opening up the Bible is his people, and that's a shame. So be good Christians today and go out and win people over. Don't push them away. Don't worry about the dogmatic things in life. Celebrate as you celebrate Christ, whether it be that this is any other day or this day is special to you. May it be all in the honor of the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Amen. Amen. And if you don't know the Jesus we're speaking about, it's quite simple. He died and rose on the third day to abolish our sins. And if this sounds of interest to you, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you are the Son of God. And I would like you to come into my heart and save me from all my sins. Walk with me, Jesus, and be my Lord and Savior for the rest of my life and all eternity. In Jesus' mighty name, thank you, Father, for the Son. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Amen. Happy holidays. God bless you all. I'll see you next time.